and turn in your Bibles to uh, John chapter 17, verse 3. And this session is session 11 in the class, The Indwelling Life, or Indwelling Life, and this session is Communion with Christ. And just to be clear, when I talk about communion with Christ, I'm not talking about eating the bread and drinking the wine, the juice, as a symbol of our covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm talking about in this, in this teaching, I'm talking about intimacy with Jesus Christ, is that, is that the, Holy, the indwelling Holy Spirit is joined to your human spirit Therefore, you can know God internally. You can know God intimately. You can know him deeply. You can know him personally. And that's really what this session is going to be about, is communion with Christ. And so the Lord's praying, and he's, he's praying in John chapter 17, verse 3, and he says, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Wait a second. I thought eternal life was dying and going to heaven. I mean, didn't you think that? Didn't you think eternal life meant that you, when you die, you go to heaven? I mean, that's what I was taught growing up in an evangelical church. It was like week after week. It was all about salvation, which I'm incredibly grateful for because I was born again in that evangelical church. But, but here the Lord is not saying eternal life is dying and going to heaven. <clears throat> the Lord says, eternal life is knowing God. Isn't that a shift in the way we think? And isn't that a shift in what we've been taught? I thought that eternal life was about your destination. But the Lord says, no, it's about your destiny. See, what the Lord is saying here is eternal life, that life that is without beginning and without end, it's the zoe life of God. It's not the bios animal life. It's not the suke soul life, but it's the zoe life of God. It's the life of God that God has in himself that is without beginning and without end. That life that God has in and of himself, he's put into your human spirit when you were born again. And your human spirit has been grafted to the Holy Spirit, the indwelling spirit. And that life of Jesus Christ in your human spirit now gives you the innate internal ability to know God intimately, personally, and deeply. It's an incredible promise. It's, I mean, what, uh, what an incre I mean, that just shows you the heart of Jesus. The heart of Jesus is intimacy. God is supremely relational. God wants to be in this, this deep, intimate relationship with you and with me. He wants us to know him, not just know about him, but to know him, to know him deeply, to know him intimately, to know him personally. See, when you, believe, when you begin to believe in and partake of Jesus Christ, that life that is in God himself that Zoe life, that's, that's superlative, that's higher than all other forms of life, that life that is in the Son is now placed into your human spirit. And your human spirit is now one with Christ who is life. Therefore, you can know God intimately. Do you realize this? You, can, you, re, you really, really, really can Know God more than you know any other person, even yourself. I believe that. Now, I realize we haven't fully tapped into that, but that's available. That is available to know Christ, to know him, not just to know about him, but to know Christ. Now, let's turn to John, 1 John chapter 5, verse 12. 1 John chapter 5 Verse 12 is, and as we turn there, just, just keep this idea in mind, is that God's life in you enables you to know God. 1 John 5, 12. He who has the Son has the life. See, 
If Christ is in you, you have his life in you. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. Therefore, eternal life is Christ in you possessing you. In fact, you will not go to heaven if you don't have his life in you before you die. That's why Jesus said you must be born again. See, eternal life is Christ in you possessing you. It's not somewhere you go. Eternal life begins at new birth and increases as Christ in you begins to increase and self begins to decrease. Eternal in the Greek is, has the meaning of without a beginning, without an end. God's life that is without beginning and without end, his Zoe life, is implanted into your spirit. And as, as Christ begins to increase and as self begins to decrease, you begin to partake of that eternal life in a much, much deeper, deeper way. See, eternal life describes a state of being in, in of being a state of being that you enter into at salvation that is greatly enhanced far beyond the mind's ability to presently comprehend in eternity. See, I love this about God. Eternal life was implanted within you so that you may know God personally, deeply, intimately, more than you know anyone and anybody else. See, eternal life is not a place where you go Eternal life is a person that you know. <laughs> John, <laughs> that was funny. John's like, do do do. <laughs> Little brother picking on me here. But it's true. Eternal life is not a place where you go. Eternal life is a person that you know. That is an incredible thing God's given us that we might be able to know him. See, we don't have to wait until we die to go to heaven to experience this. Eternal life is right now for the here and now. There's so many Christians. I'm just, I'm just seeing this, you know, this whole revival is beginning to break out in, in Asbury and every single person on, I, I get on Twitter a lot just to kind of get an idea of what's going on out there. And every single person is now a revival expert and they're all weighing in on all their opinions. And, you know, it's like, it's like so annoying. It's like everybody has to have an opinion about what's happening. And I, somehow all these people who don't believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, who are very staunch fundamentalists, I, they've begun to show up on my timeline and they're grumpy and they're mad and they're like, this can't be God and this is what's wrong with it and all this. And I just realized, okay, there is a lot of people in the church that know about God. But there's a lot fewer that actually know him. Knowing about God is intellectual. Knowing God is intuitive in your spirit. You can know about God. Now, I think it's awesome to know about God. We need to know about God. We need to get into the Word and study and, and look up the uh, Scripture verses. And we need to understand Greek words and cross-references and all of that. That's very, very important. But I realize that knowing about God and knowing God is vastly, vastly different. And so what the Lord is saying is that you have now been granted eternal life in you and that eternal life in you gives you that innate ability to know God personally. Lord, what are you doing right now? Lord, what are you doing in Asbury? I don't have to give my opinion. Lord, I want to know, Lord, what are you doing? You can know him. You can know him, know his heart, know his opinion. Lord, what is it you're doing? You don't have to give all these you know, these analysis of my opinions and human wisdom. We can know God. We can know him. This word in John 17, 3 is gnosko. And it's used 220 times in the New Testament. This word in the Greek means, I'm just going to make it real simple. It means to know through experience. One of those grumpy tweeters, or whatever, whatever you call them, one of those grumpy tweeters tweeted last week that, 
You can't, you can't experience God. You just got to know him through the Bible. The Bible is sufficient. Now, I believe the Bible is sufficient, but we can also experience him. Because gnosko in the Greek means to know God by experiencing him. And that, that inward knowing is, is you have that innate ability when you're born again by your spirit and the Holy Spirit being one. And this brings me to the second principle of the spirit-led life, is that spirit-to-spirit -spirit communion with Christ is the food that strengthens, nourishes, and energizes your spiritual life. You know, we've been going through, we're going through 10 principles of the spirit-led life. We talked about your spirit in the last section, last session, that intuitive ability to know God's voice. Well, the, the second principle is spirit-to-spirit -spirit communion with Christ is the food that strengthens, nourishes, and energizes your spiritual life. See, I, just, I believe that so much of the church is, is making the very same error that the Pharisees did when the Lord said, you search the scriptures because you think in them there are life, but you're unwilling to come to me that you might have life. Now, again, if you're hearing from me, don't read the Bible. That is the last thing I'm saying. Read the Bible. Go deep in the Bible. Go deep in the Word. Understand this, this Word. Go deep, deep, deep in the Word of God. But you've got to also understand is you can know the Bible backwards and forwards and not know God. Don't just read the Bible and skip out on the knowing God part Go to him and meet with him in the word as you read. Lord, come and speak to me. Amen. Amen. See, so much of Christianity has boiled down to, I'm trying to know God with my intellectual mind. Intellectualism, I'm going to read the Bible, and I'm going to cross-reference it. I'm going to study. And again, that's, that's, we need to do that. But I'm convinced that that is just like the first century. The Pharisees, they knew, the, I mean, they spent eight hours a day or more studying the Scriptures. And yet the very one these Scriptures pointed to, when he stood right before them, the Pharisees could not see the one whom all Scripture pointed to. They knew in their minds what God had done, but they did not recognize the Word made flesh standing right before them, even though they had read all the Messianic prophecies. A lot of people in the church, a lot of people in the church know the Word, and I'm grateful for that. I'm so grateful they know the Word because we've got to know the Scriptures. But... We can know the scriptures and not know God intimately and personally and actually persecute what he himself is actually doing. See, we, again, let me just say this again. You can know about God by your intellect, but you can only know God by your spirit's intuition. Now, that, what I mean is that's where the knowing of God begins is in your spirit. The knowing of God begins in your spirit. See, Jesus did not say eternal life is reading books about me. Eternal life is not reading commentaries about me. Eternal life is not even reading the Bible and studying the Bible. Eternal life, that, that life that is without beginning or end, that eternal life is knowing God through experience. You're meant to experience God. It's beautiful. Gosh, it's beautiful. Just the Lord has called you into the most incredible, intimate relationship you could, even, you could ever fathom. And your relationship is going to be very different than my relationship. The Lord wants you to have your pers that personal, intimate relationship with him. See, one of the things that, that was a big paradigm shift for me was I used to try to hear from God I didn't realize, before I realized spirit, soul, body, I used to try to hear from God in my mind. And so, therefore, I would try to hear these thoughts and, you know, but what I was doing was like, okay, thinking these thoughts were God's thoughts, but they were really my own soul speaking to me or my own emotions speaking to me. It was not the voice of God. It was not until I understood 
No, I am spirit, I am soul, and I am body. And the indwelling Holy Spirit who's joined to my spirit speaks to me in my spirit. I mean, that, that's simple, like 101, but it's like, wow, the light bulbs went off. And I was like, okay, Lord, if that is true, if you speak to me in my spirit as one of the primary ways you speak, I'm not saying he doesn't ever speak outside in, but the primary way, the, the inside out way God speaks is spirit to spirit, then I'm not trying to hear from God in my rational mind. I'm not trying to hear from God in my emotions. I'm not trying to hear from God by how I feel. I'm not trying to hear from God in my willpower or strength. I'm not trying to hear from God in, in the external ways. I'm, I'm very much focused on that place where God speaks, which is your spirit. Where you just know, oh, okay, I just know you're speaking here. You're speaking right here. And, you know, we looked at in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 in the last session is that we, can, we have access to the mind of Christ. We have access to the mind of Christ. Therefore, we can know God's thoughts. That is a beautiful thing. <laughs> that, that spirit to spirit thought transference where God's thoughts in heaven are communicated to the indwelling spirit who searches all things, even the depths of God, and he speaks to you not by human words of wisdom, not by the mind and the intelligence, not by the emotions, not by this rational thinking and rational brain. Not to mean there's not a part in that, there is. But that, that in the spirit, by combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. And when you begin focusing on that place where God speaks, you can then begin to recognize the voice of God much more clearly. And you can know, wow, you know, Lord, you've been speaking to me, and I didn't even realize it. I've been so trying to hear here or with my ears or my eyes or my brain that I'm not, I'm not hearing you in uh, it, where you speak. So if you want to cultivate a spirit-to-spirit -spirit relationship with the Lord, focus in on that place where he primarily speaks to you in your spirit. You know, Jesus said that, that God is searching for worshipers, and those who worship God must worship in spirit and in truth. See, the, the worship God is after, it begins internally. It doesn't begin externally. It doesn't begin from the outside in. It begins from the inside out. And I would say, not only is worship, does it originate in the spirit, so does communion, so does fellowship with the Holy Spirit. It begins in, this, in the inside out way God moves. Let's, let's go back to 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. Or start with verse 9. Again, I, I, would, I would really encourage you to, to read through 1 Corinthians chapter 2. But Paul's saying here is, Just as it is written, things which eye has not seen... And ear has not heard, which have not entered the heart of man. In other words, the eye can't see, the ear can't hear, the heart can't perceive. In other words, God primarily does not speak to the eyes, to the ears, to the heart. I'm not saying he never does. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us, God has revealed them through the Spirit. This is not a wait until you die reality. This is meant to be experienced in the here and the now. That thing which eye has not seen, ear has not heard, the heart has not understood, God has revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God is you can now know, this, I just want to raise your, your level of belief and expectation, you can know the depth of God. See, a lot of times you think, okay, me, little insignificant me, I can never know the depths of God. And the Lord's like, no, you, you can know the depths of God if you're hungry and if you're thirsty. If you're hungry and you are thirsty, you can know the depths of God. 
And, and Paul says, you can know the depths of God because he dwells inside of you. Now let's turn to Revelation chapter 3, verse 16. Revelation chapter 3, verse 16, is the Lord has invited you into a dining, communing relationship with him. And it's to the, to the messages, messages of the seven churches when the Lord's speaking, and he speaks to Laodicea. And he says, and you know, if you've been in the evangelical church for a while, you've often heard this is a call to salvation. But he's actually speaking to the church. He's speaking to his people. He's speaking to believers and you've heard this before, we've said it many times here, is behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him. I just want to lay, lay this vision before you. Jesus longs to be in a relationship with you that's like a dining experience. You know, when you go out to eat and you eat with your friends or you eat with your family and you're, you're talking over a meal, what, I mean, I love doing that. It's, it's because you begin to get real with people. You begin to open up your heart. You begin to share your heart. They begin to share their heart. And the conversation is, is, is I don't know why it is, but it's so much better over a meal sometimes, you know? And you get real, they get real, and this, the food bonds you together. I don't know, I mean, am I the only one? I love food, so maybe I'm the only one that's like that. Ellie raises her hand. I know Ellie, that's, hey, Ellie, you can eat the true bread of life in this dining experience. Me and Ellie like food about the same level. So, yeah, so anyway, that is what the, the relationship with the Lord is like. I just, you know, just think about the most incredible meal with your greatest, closest friends sharing over that meal that is what your relationship with the Lord is meant to be like. It's not meant to be, if, if you find yourself that you're bored in your relationship with God, if it's boring, if it's mechanical, if it's dry and it's dead, you're doing something wrong, okay? I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm just saying the Lord, what he's offering to you is a dining experience, I'm not saying like every single day you're going to experience the glory of God, but you can experience this a lot more than you realize if you, if you understand the Lord is inside of you. you. You have fellowship with him. He lives inside of you. you. You can have a dining experience, a rich, conversational, intimate relationship with the Lord. That is what you have been called into. You have been called into fellowship with God. And so the Lord is standing outside of the church, of the Laodicean church, who's filled with so many things, so many material blessings, and they say, I have need of nothing. And the Lord's knocking on the outside saying, let me come in. And if you let me come in, I will allow you to have that dining experience with me. I want that. I've tapped into that just a little bit. I mean, I have so far to go. I've tapped into that just a little bit, but man, it is awesome. It is awesome. It is, it is the most incredible experience in life, I think. There's nothing like it. And I want more. We've got to have more. I just want you to hear the heart of God. If you open the door to your heart, I will come in and I will give you a dining experience with me. Ask the Lord what that looks like for you. This is not only foreshadowing the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's not only foreshadowing this place where we are going to dwell in the Holy of Holies of the New Jerusalem for all eternity and feast on the hidden manna that is Jesus Christ and that hidden place of the holy of holy worship where feasting on his words for all eternity. You can begin that experience now. A holy of holies relationship with Jesus Christ. You are the temple. You know, you don't have to run here, there, and everywhere. We were talking yesterday with my family. It's like, okay, I'm so happy about what's going on in Asbury, but I would rather just 
go get a good cup of coffee and spend time with the Lord in my kitchen table and just hear from him and dine with him here, you know, unless the Lord sends me there. But once you begin to tap into it, you don't have to run here, there, and everywhere to meet with God. You have the reviver inside of you. Again, I'm, I'm not slamming the revival chasers. Maybe some need to calm down some. But, I mean, I appreciate that people want to experience that. But, man, when you get the revelation that Christ is in you, and you get the revelation that you can dine with him, and you begin to partake of that, you're like, okay, God, it, the Lord would have to almost force you to go up there. Like, oh, do I have to go up there? You know, I would rather drink my coffee with you and commune with you in the secret place. Once you've tasted of that, there's nothing like it. I just want to encourage you, you can have that. That's meant to be what you experience every day. Now, I'm not saying some days you're like, okay, Jesus, what's your last? I mean, we're like, where are you? You feel a million miles away. But it's not like it's, every single day is going to be the glory realm. But you can have so much more than you can, than you can even fathom. You can live and feast on the mind of Christ by revelation. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And once you taste of it, you're just like, I'm ruined forever by this. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55 and Revelation chapter 3 really go hand in hand. Isaiah 55 is almost the the old covenant version of what Jesus is saying in Revelation chapter 3. But here's what the Lord says, challenging the Israel, challenging his people, challenging the church. He says, ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He's challenging how thirsty are you really? How thirsty are you really? How hungry are you really for God? How hungry are you? How thirsty are you? Lord, make us more hungry and more thirsty. You who have no money, buy, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Verse 2. Why do you spend your money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? In other words... They had the same problem as Laodicea. They were trying to fill that God-shaped hole in their heart that yearns for God and is restless without God. They were trying to fill that hole in their heart with, by, with material blessings. I mean, doesn't that describe the American church who is probably the most prosperous, it, it, not probably, we are the most prosperous nation in the history of the world, and yet we are trying to fill it with all this all this material stuff to try to say, I want to fill the, my heart with a bigger TV or more games or, you know, whatever, the, uh, more streaming videos, whatever it is. I'm trying to fill my heart, the craving of my heart with these things. And the Lord's like, why are you spending your money on all these different material things? It's not like God's not allowing you to have material things. That's not really what he's saying. He's like, you're trying to be satisfied by all this stuff and you've got an endless supply of stuff that you, ha you have access to in America. Why do you keep trying to spend your money on those things that cannot truly satisfy you? God himself is our satisfaction. And until we find satisfaction and enjoyment in God, we will never find rest in our soul. And the Lord has said, or the Lord is, is challenging, why are you spending your wages for what does not satisfy me? I love this next statement here. He says, listen carefully to me. Now, that's not like, it's not like, you, you know, when you're talking to your kids or whatever, and they're doing something, and you're like, listen carefully now. That's not the, what the Lord's saying. He's saying, listen carefully to me and what I speak to you. He's saying, if you have an ear to hear, listen carefully. See, it's so easy to get dull of hearing. It's so easy not to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church. 
And he's challenging. He's saying, okay, you've tried all the stuff the world says will satisfy you. All of those things, the material blessings, you've tried all those things. None of those satisfy you. Listen carefully to me. Feast on me. Feast on my words. If you listen carefully to me and eat what is good, and listen to what he says, you can delight yourself in abundance. So many Christians are miserably, miserably bored in their relationship with the Lord. Like, this is mechanical, this is boring, this is duty. And if, listen, if you're bored in your relationship with the Lord, you are not going to spend the time seeking Him. You will not do what bores you. But I'm going to tell you, if you're bored, if it's mechanical, if it's duty, if it's not a delight, if it's not joy, if it's not pleasure, you're missing something. And I believe that something is that innate ability inside of you, in your human spirit, to know God. To know God through his word, to know God by experience, to know the voice of God through what he speaks in his word, through what he has spoken in his word, and how he speaks to you. Here's what the Lord is saying. Delight yourself in abundance. I mean, there, there's so much negativity in the world right now. You can hardly watch the news. It's, it's awful. You can hardly get on social media. It's just like self-promotion and people who are mad and grumpy. And the Lord's like, okay, all that stuff is crumbling, but I want to tell you there is a place that you can go of great joy and great delight. Go there and fill yourself up with it. Just delight yourself in that, in that place. I love verse 3. When you come to God, don't come to God with a prayer list. Okay, I'm not against prayer lists, but don't come to God like a kid going to see Santa Claus. Santa Claus. Okay, these are the things I want. These are the things I need. Okay, Lord, would you do this? Would you do that? Don't come to God. The Lord didn't say, when you come to me, come with a prayer list. He says, when you come to me, incline your ear. Okay, Lord, what are you saying? Now, again, he's not saying incline your physical ear. He's saying incline your spiritual ear. He's saying pay close attention to your spirit and what I'm speaking to your spirit. He says, when you come to me, come to me to listen. Now, the Lord might direct you to read something in Scripture. The Lord might direct you he might say a word to you in your spirit and you begin to write it down. I don't know how the Lord will speak, but come, come the Lord saying, come to me with an inclined ear ready to hear. I'm going to speak to you. That's what he's saying. Come to me. I am going to speak to you. You can hear God. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. God's word is life. God's word is life. So let me ask you, what is your prayer life truly like? Are you truly, are you bored? I'm just, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. But is, is, is your, and I'm not talking about, when I'm talking about prayer, there's a inter, corporate intercession is different than your quiet time with the Lord. I'm not talking about corporate intercession. Okay, so are you bored? Has your prayer life become mechanical, a duty, dry? See, because if it is, you're not going to last very long doing it because the human heart is designed in such a way that if we're not finding true joy and freedom and delight in something, duty can only carry us for a, a period of time. <laughs> if you're not finding delight in the Lord, then you're doing prayer wrong. You're going to God with a prayer list rather than going to God with an ear inclined. You're going to just lay out, all, Lord, all these things you want to do for me, 
and I need done rather than, Lord, what is it you're speaking? Lord, what is it you're saying? See, I just, wanted to, I just want to encourage you. God is meant to be enjoyed. God is meant to be delighted in. There, there is a river of pleasure in the heart of God that you can enjoy God at the deepest level to where it's the most incredible thing you've ever experienced. This is not preacher talk. It's not preacher talk. I want to cast a vision for you. You can go in to this dining, communing experience with the Lord every single day. Not going to him and saying, God, I need this, I need that, this is the way I feel, this is what I'm thinking, this is what I'm wondering. I was like, just, would you hush for a second? Would you be quiet? Come to me and listen. I, again, it doesn't mean you can never pour out your heart to God. It doesn't mean you can't have honest and real conversations with the Lord. That's not what I'm saying. But come to the Lord with that ear inclined, ready to listen. He will speak. He will speak. Be confident. Be confident. And if you're having a trouble, if you're having trouble, you know, really hearing from God, it's probably because either you, your spirit has been underdeveloped and you need to develop your spirit more, or you're trying to hear from him externally with your ear or your mind or your emotions rather than learning to hear from God in your spirit. It takes time. It takes time to develop that ability to, to hear, to have the thoughts of God and to, to know how to uh, commune with him in that way. So I thought what I would do is just go through some practical things I've learned about communion with Christ to hopefully help you, uh, help you have a more enjoyable, delightful prayer life because you know, I've, I've lived through that. I've lived through the, that, those really dry, boring, dead prayer times. You're like, God, I can't wait till this is over. You know, you're like, I've been praying and you think you've been praying and praying and praying. It's only been five minutes. And you're like, oh God, this is so boring. Okay. Let me check my social media and see what's going on. And Okay, if that describes you, let me just hopefully share with you some things I've learned that have made my prayer life so much more enjoyable, so much more satisfying is uh, the first thing that I've learned is that is you've got to pray until the shift comes. You got to pray until the shift comes. Now, what I mean by that is, is when you start your prayer time, 99% of the time, you're going to start off in the flesh. 99% of the time, you are going to start out with your soul leading or your body leading rather than your spirit. Your spirit is going to likely be suppressed, dormant. The life of Christ is not going to be activated uh, I mean, you, you, this is just me. Maybe you're different, but I usually start and it's like, okay, okay, Lord, I, you know, I, you're waking up and you're just, it's like, man, I don't feel life or energy. Okay, press in, press in. Pray until your human spirit connected to the spirit of Jesus Christ be, is strengthened by the power of God. See, you need that, 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 the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead that is connected to your human spirit. You need that trans, transmission of his divine power, his resurrection power to empower you so that, you're, so that your spirit rises up, so to speak, and becomes the strongest part of your being there, and it brings your soul and your body into submission because when your spirit is strongest, the, that, ability, that innate ability to intuitively know God's voice begins to be sharp and crisp, discerning, and that dullness that is true. See, when you're living in your soul, when, when the soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions is living in the body, the cravings of the body are stronger, and the soul is stronger, and those two work together are stronger than your spirit, then your spirit's innate ability to intuitively know God's speak, that inward knowing that inward knowing of God's, God's voice becomes dull. Does that make sense? And when, you're, when your spirit is dull, then you cannot discern God speak. The spiritual person discerns all things. But when you're a soulish or carnal person, living by the soul, living by the mind, the will, and the emotions... Your spirit is dull, and you cannot hear, 
and recognize the voice of God. So what you've got to do is you've got to pray until that shift comes. You, so that might take you 30 minutes. It might take you an hour. It might take you, you know, praying in the spirit. It might take you just, God, I, I pray Ephesians chapter 3 all the time. Every morning almost I pray Ephesians chapter 3. Father, would you strengthen me with power and with might in my spirit? Lord, and I, I, and I wait until I can start feeling the, inwardly that the power of Jesus Christ being transmitted to my spirit, I can slowly feel, okay, now my spirit is stronger. Now my spirit is stronger than my soul. Now the analytical mind is quieted. Now the emotions that want to feel everything are subdued. Now the craving of the senses are not as strong as they were. Now my spirit is, is being strengthened. Now, my, now Christ is strengthening my spirit. Now the spirit of God is coming to dwell inside of my heart. Now when that shift comes, then that natural, see what happens is the, just like the mind when it's in control thinks and the emotions feel and the body craves and all that, when your spirit is in control, that natural ability to know begins to function organically. And so you can just know, okay, I'm supposed to read this passage of scripture. I just know God's speaking to me, be still and know that I'm God. I know that God's saying, do this or do that. I, your, your knower begins to be activated when you're praying and your spirit is strong. Does that make sense? Kind of, maybe. Keep, just press in until that happens. Now, the next thing that's really helped me is to be still and know that he is God. Psalms 46.10 says, be still and know that I am God. Is, now, when God says to be still, a lot of people take it to the other extreme and they become so still they fall asleep. <laughs> Has that ever happened to you? It's happened to me. That is not the stillness God wants. God is not saying be still and go take a nap. <laughs> okay? What he's saying is quiet your soul. Quiet your mind, quiet your emotions, quiet your cravings of your body, quiet it by having a strong spirit. And once your spirit is awake, once your spirit is alert, once your spirit is strong, once your spirit is now subduing your soul and body, governing and influencing your soul and your body, then with your spirit active and your soul under the control of the spirit, then you can know he's God. Then you can say, okay, now I can know. Now I can discern. Now I can receive those spiritual thoughts. And all the striving and the stress and the anxiety and the worry goes down. And when your spirit is active, when your spirit is alert, you can then now discern in your spirit what the Lord's direction, okay? I want you, you know, however it works, I want you to read Matthew chapter 5 right now. Brian, I'm speaking to you this. I'm speaking to you that. You can't, you can't get to that place when your soul is so active and your body is so active and they're stronger than your spirit. Your spirit has to be the strongest part of your being to really be able to hear from God. Let's read Psalms 46.10. I'm going to read it here in the New King James as the Lord says, be still. One, one translation says, let go and relax and know. I believe that's, again, hitting on the intuition, that intuitive, inward knowing. Know I am God. I'm God in heaven. I'm God in your heart. I am God. Now, the third thing that helps me, this, this, this really, really helped me tremendously, is the Lord says often, come to me. You know, you can read about it in the Gospels. Come to me, come to me, come to me. Okay, I used to wonder, okay, how do I, how do, I do that? You're in heaven. How do I come to you? Do I just, you know, try to, I don't know, 
connect with you in heaven and, or whatever. Okay, Lord, how do you actually, how do I actually come to you? And I was also often trying to like connect with God in heaven. And the Lord's like, no, come to me in you. It's like, oh my gosh. You know, I've, I've lived that long and never realized that. When the Lord is saying, come to me, he's saying, come to me in you. Does that make sense? Your spirit is the holy of holies. Go inward to meet with him. Go inward to meet with him. So the Lord was saying to me, come to me in you. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ is in you. You're not going to try to meet with him in heaven. Turn inward to the holy of holies of your temple and experience that holy of holies relationship with him. Come to me in you. The way I think about it is like when Peter was walking on the water and he's walking on the water and he's like, Lord, if it's you, call me to you. And the Lord said, come. It's like the Lord saying, Brian, Ken, Donna, whoever, John, come to me in you. To meet with God in your spirit where he dwells. Some, I'm sure those people on Twitter will be like, oh, you're saying new age. <laughs> This is not new age. This is, this is because Jesus Christ lives in me. I can do this. If I'm trying to turn into my inward self, that would be new age. But I'm not turning inward to myself. I'm turning inward to meet with Jesus Christ, who is inside of me, who is now joined to my human spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit. I'm going to meet with him who is joined to my, holy, my, my human spirit to commune with him, to fellowship with him, to have those, thought, that, those thoughts transferred to know his mind, to know his heart, to receive revelation. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Number four is pay attention to your spirit, your spirit's knower, your spirit's intuition. As you, as you do this, pay close attention, okay? What is the Lord saying and always, I just encourage you, always have a notebook and a pencil or a pen in hand because the, write down those things the Lord is, is putting on you in, in your spirit. He might, say, he might say that you need to turn to this passage of Scripture in the Bible. He might say that, you know, he might start giving you a, a word. A word, what I found is that the Lord will start, the Lord will give you a phrase, you know, whatever, uh, beloved, I love you, or uh, beloved, abide in me. Well, if you will start writing that down, and as you're writing that down, you're, you're paying attention in your spirit to that knower, that knowing as you write down, okay, Lord, okay, I'm knowing, as I'm writing, I'm knowing this, I'm knowing here, I'm paying attention to this knowing inside of me, and then you write down what you know as you're, you're kind of doing this two-way two thing. You're writing down and you're knowing. You're writing down and you're knowing. And you're writing down what you, you're sensing in your spirit, what the Holy Spirit is transmitting to your knower. And you begin to write that down. And, it's, and when you're done, you're like, wow, okay. You just spoke this to me. This is awesome. This is great. Okay? So I do that all the time. All the time. And it, it, and it makes prayer way, way more interesting, okay? Number five is, is we need to test and separate the spiritual from the soulish. I guarantee you, if you start doing this, some things you write down are not going to be God. That's okay, all right? Just don't, you know, don't go rush out and share it. You're learning how to hear him speak. You're learning how to commune with him. Some things are going to be hijacked by your own thoughts, some things are going to be hijacked by your own feelings. Some things are going to be hijacked by your own desires. And that's why, like, when Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 19, the Lord said, if you will extract the precious from the worthless, then you can be my spokesman. If you will learn, you know, and Paul said, test 
prophecy. Test prophecy. You know, this is not necessarily prophecy, but test what you're hearing. Okay, Lord, okay, is this really God? And there's been times I thought it was God, and it wasn't. There's been times when I didn't think it was God, but it actually was. And as you learn to develop this sense, as you learn by practice to to, uh, separate that which is of the soul from that which is of the spirit, what you're going to learn is that more and more, more and more, you are learning how to separate the mixture so that you can have the true word of the Lord, the true communing, conversational intimacy that God is speaking with you. Hopefully that helps. But I can't say enough how important it is, how important it is for you to to test and separate what you're hearing, you know, because the soul, see, if, if it's a dream or it's a vision or if it's a trance or an angelic encounter, you pretty much know, okay, this is God. But when you're trying to hear God inwardly, the, the ability for the soul, for the mind, the will, and the emotions to get mixed in goes up very much. But you want the pure word of the Lord. You don't want, you know, just be humble about it. You don't want, you, some people get so, no, God spoke to me. God spoke to me this. And you're basically taking a stand on your own soulish imagination. Be humble about it. If it's the Lord, you'll know over time the Lord spoke that to me. Does that make sense? So in conclusion, in conclusion, the Lord has invited you into a dining experience with him. The Lord has invited you to commune with Jesus Christ. You are meant to have a relationship where you feast on the person of Jesus Christ. He is the bread you eat. He is the wine you drink. He is the lamb of God. He is uh, that, that feasting upon him. Come to me. Eat, eat of me. Drink of me. That intimate, personal, dining relationship with him. You can have the most incredible, joyful, delightful experience with him. The, the spiritual food, this is spiritual food that strengthens your spiritual life. And every one of us can have that deeper and and more um, intimate if we desire it. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we love you, Lord. I just want to pray for us, Lord, that, Lord, we could have a much deeper experience of you, Lord. God, give us the ability to have a much deeper communing experience with you, Lord. I just want to pray that right now for everyone listening in person, everyone listening online, Lord, myself included, absolutely myself included, I don't want to just know about you. I don't want to just read about you. I don't want to just study about you, though I do want to do those things. I want to know you. Lord, I want to know your heart. I want to know you by experience. I want to know you intuitively. I want to know you inwardly. I want to know you personally. Just tell the Lord, just tell the Lord you want to know him. If you want to know him, just, I want to know you, Lord. Father, I pray that for everyone who has experienced, who's presently their prayer life, presently their prayer life seems dry and boring. I just want to pray for the spirit of grace to be, be poured out on prayer, individual prayer lives. Even as dad was praying about the spirit of grace, and the spirit of supplication being poured out in our corporate prayer, I pray, Father, for the spirit of grace and the spirit of prayer, but I'm talking about, in this case, conversational intimacy with the Lord, of that communing, ongoing conversation with you, Lord, where we're listening and we're hearing, we're walking with you. I mean, if Enoch walked with God under the old, it was even in the old covenant back then, back in the early days in the book of Genesis, if Enoch walked with God, and he didn't, that meant he was in this communing relationship with God. How much more us where the indwelling spirit is, is, is joined to our human spirit? I just want to encourage you, the, 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 there's no limitation. There is absolutely no limitation whatsoever in your relationship with him. 
Lord, I just pray right now that you would bring us into that, that deeper intimacy with you. Lord, I pray that you would give, you would give everyone here that, the confidence to know they, this is not just reserved for the pastor. This is not just reserved for some prophet or apostle or some mighty man of God. This is, this is meant to be the normal Christian life of knowing God Knowing God. I want to pray, Lord, draw us into that. Draw us into that experiential knowing of you, I pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. We're going to end the online portion here.